I believe every person has a right to basic knowledge of how to optimize their mind, body, and spirit. Here, I bring to you influential individuals and ideas to help you live a more healthy, fulfilling life. I'm Julie Fouché, and I'd like to welcome you to Pursuing Health. Welcome back to Pursuing Health. This is episode number 22, and I'll be sitting down with functional nutritionist Bridget Titkemeyer. A little bit of background about Bridget before we get started. She's a registered dietitian nutritionist at the Center for Functional Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. She received her undergraduate degree from Miami University of Ohio in dietetics and her master's of science in public health nutrition from Case Western Reserve University. She worked in the Center for Lifestyle Medicine of the Cleveland Clinic Wellness Institute for several years prior to joining the Center for Functional Medicine when it opened in the fall of 2014. She's also contributed to numerous articles in the mainstream media on health and nutrition topics in publications including the U.S. News and World Report as well as the Huffington Post. In this podcast, we sit down to talk a little bit about how she became interested in nutrition as well as her educational path, and then we talk about her role as a functional nutritionist at the Center for Functional Medicine. Before we get started, a few quick reminders. Number one, if you're enjoying the podcast, please head over to iTunes to subscribe and give it a rating. Also, you can go to my website, juliefouché.com, and enter your email there to stay in the loop with my newsletter every two weeks. I'm also always looking for inspiring stories to share. So if you or someone you know has used lifestyle to overcome a serious health challenge, please send your story to me at info at juliefouché.com and I'll select some to share on future episodes. If you're interested in training with me, check out my program through Beyond the Whiteboard. This is the actual training I'm doing now, five days per week, one hour per day, scheduled out for you minute by minute from warm up to cool down. We're getting ready for the CrossFit Games open this week. So if you'd like to check it out, please visit beyondthewhiteboard.com slash Julie Fouché. So with that, let's get started here on Pursuing Health. This is episode number 22 with functional nutritionist Bridget Titkemeyer. Welcome back to Pursuing Health. I am sitting here with Bridget Titkemeyer, and we're in her office here at the Cleveland Clinic, and we're just going to talk a little bit about how she got to where she is today, what she does on a daily basis, um, and some other fun things like that. So lots of fun, lots things. of fun things. <laughs> um, and how she just did her first CrossFit workout, which was super exciting too, <laughs> which we just talked about. And I was laying on the floor after and <laughs> said, wow, this actually is so much more intense than yoga. I don't remember the last time I was this tired. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a different level of intensity from yoga. Very different. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so maybe you could start off and talk with us a little bit about how you got interested in nutrition in the first place, um, where that came from. Okay. Yeah. I love talking about that. Um, so when I was uh, 14, um, I was uh, dealing with a few medical conditions and, um, the doctors here at the Cleveland clinic were, um, pushing a lot of medications Mm -hmm. and my parents didn't like the idea of me uh, being dependent on medications. And um, so they took me to a homeopathic doctor, Dr. Sprecher Mm -hmm. um, in the Cleveland area. And she started doing all of these tests on me. What some of the tests that actually we run now that she was running about 12 years ago, um, which I just found my results recently from. And it's just so interesting now comparing it to the results that I'm interpreting or that the doctors are interpreting for patients. Um, So she put me on an elimination diet and I hated every second of it for the first (laughs) month. And I refused to believe that there was any connection with the Mm -hmm. foods that I was eating and how I was feeling. And then um, after about a month, it became hard to deny that I was making improvements and feeling better and um, noticing the association with the foods that I was eating. And my family was always fairly healthy. Like Mm -hmm. my mom made dinner every night growing up and um, my dad cooks too. So it's not like I was ever eating bad foods, Mm -hmm. but um, removing some of the foods that um, specifically gluten, Mm -hmm. um, we identified through like food sensitivity testing, um, my body wasn't responding well to. Mm -hmm. And uh, so since then I've, um, been gluten free for the last, um, 
since I was 14. <laughs> and um, then I decided that I wanted to study nutrition. Okay. And I did my senior project at Metro. And I remember the dietitian that I was with telling me that um, I should reconsider going into nutrition because it was a horrible field to go into. And oh, that if no. I wanted anyone to listen to me that I should become a nurse. <laughs> and it was so deflating. I was like, what? Wow. No. <laughs> After you've gotten that far. Yeah. So th- I still ended up studying um, dietetics in undergrad. And it wasn't what I expected it to be because it's very... Um, it's different from a like medical nutrition therapy side mm-hmm. and there's um, really only recognition for going gluten free f- if you have celiac disease and things mm-hmm. like that because the research isn't there for like um, non-celiac gluten sensitivities and mm-hmm. intolerances and so I kept being like well what about people that are gluten free what right. about people that are dairy free <laughs> and they're like we don't we don't know what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> so you got, did you get a lot of pushback going through sort of your undergrad classes and Yes. Asking those questions. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then I designed my um, my food science project to be mm-hmm. on, like, how to make the best gluten-free. Um, it was, like, this little cookie type of thing, mm-hmm. which isn't obviously healthy, <laughs> but <laughs> from sure a textural perspective, for people that need to be gluten-free, it would be important. Um And so that was, like, how kind of how it started when I um, – had my own experience and then went to new, um, study dietetics in undergrad and it wasn't exactly what I had expected it to be. Mm-hmm. And um, then when I was in grad school, I started working at the Wellness Institute and they're very like whole foods based and they have the integrative medicine department mm-hmm. there. And, and that's here at the Cleveland Clinic, right? Yes, at the Cleveland Clinic, mm-hmm. sorry. And then it was like, wow, it all makes sense that – what I was trying to do before is that, you know, I can use the background information mm-hmm. that I learned in undergrad and then apply it in um, the way that they do in, at the Wellness Institute in Integrative Medicine. Mm-hmm. And then I came to Functional Medicine when we opened last um, – in October of 2014. Okay. And how does – you sort of started talking about this, but how does your approach now um, using more f- the functional medicine approach or functional nutrition differ from – what you might see if you just went into like a general practice or um, maybe a different type of nutrition practice? Um, That's a really good question. So I think that it's changing Mm -hmm. and that more nutrition in general is focusing on whole foods and more like anti-inflammatory approaches and things like that. But um, I remember like even when I was in my inpatient um, dietetic internship rotation Mm -hmm. in a um, hospital in Chicago and we were like pushing Ensher so much um, and there's so much sugar in Ensher and I kept being like, why are you giving Ensher to these (laughs) patients that are like critically ill? Don't you think that that won't make them better? Um, so it's more of a focus on like, let's calculate every exact nutrient and like the caloric intake and all Mm -hmm. of these things that, um, might not necessarily be as geared towards, okay, let's run these IgG, um, food sensitivity tests on you. Let's Mm -hmm. determine if you have any kind of food allergies. Let's remove those from your diet to help Mm -hmm. to decrease inflammation. Let's, you know, really, really ramp up your, um, vegetable consumption. Mm -hmm. I mean, dietitians will always educate on ramping up vegetables and things like that, but I think that it's much more, um, whole foods based the approach here and it's actually more customized to the individual Mm -hmm. so um instead of looking at like in general is coffee healthy or not healthy it's looking at okay are you able to tolerate coffee or um instead of looking at it as like just nutrition one size fits all here's what the research shows Mm -hmm. looking at it from the individual's perspective of like okay we have these labs and you're showing based on your own blood and Mm -hmm. your own urine that you have these nutrient deficiencies Mm -hmm. so how can we really ramp that up in your diet or like you have a severe need for probiotics and it's great that you're going to be taking a probiotic and then how can we also add like fermented foods and things like that to really help to um, improve the overall lining of your intestines, things like that, that are more customized. Okay. So it's more of a quality versus quantity approach, I guess, where you're you're focusing first on the quality and what that individual person needs, and then maybe addressing the quantity as sort of a secondary 
Right. Okay. That was such an easy way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that. Um, yeah. I always tell people like even just from a basic um, like nutrition, reading the nutrition label. Right. Um, to look at the ingredients before you're looking at anything else on the nutrition facts label. Mm-hmm. Because if the quality of the ingredients isn't adequate, then it doesn't matter what the numbers are on the nutrition facts. It doesn't right. matter what the total grams of fat or calories or protein are um, to really start like below at the ingredients. Mm-hmm. And then if you feel that those are quality enough, then you can start to look at um, the nutrient composition of the food. Mm-hmm. And I like what you said too about using more of an individualized approach where – it is, I think that nutrition is one of those topics that's like, we joke about, it's like religion or politics. It's like people can get so heated on it's so what the research true. is and there's research to support, I think, every angle and every side of things. So to me, it makes a lot of sense to try to focus in on the individual because maybe there's research that coffee is good and coffee is bad, but you have to figure out what what is important for this person sitting in front of you. Right, exactly. And when you start seeing enough patients, you start to identify patterns of like, okay, well, even though you're not the same person as, you know, someone that's presenting with the same symptoms, Mm -hmm. we can start with something that is research-based and um, has worked well Mm -hmm. in the past Mm -hmm. and then customize it to exactly what you need. Um, Because we always say in functional medicine that it's like you might have someone that's presenting, um, like you and I might come in and we Mm -hmm. have the exact same symptoms, um, but we have like very different backgrounds, different exposures Mm -hmm. to like toxins and bacteria and to stressors and Mm -hmm. things like that that are going to have a different impact on our symptoms, right? So it's like drilling down to maybe different causes and different treatments, even though we're presenting the same, like in a traditional doctor's office or dietitian's office, they're going to treat you as a, as a diagnosis. Whereas in functional medicine, we're focused more on treating people as people. So like how we can tailor it to all of the experiences that you've had in the past, because when you talk about how nutrition, it can be like religion or politics it becomes so confusing for people like I can't tell you the number of times that they're like I just read this and then the next day I read that that's not good and I'm so confused about how to eat well and it like shouldn't really be that complicated Mm -hmm. so I feel like making it less political and more about like okay how can we work with the experiences that you've had and move you in something that will be sustainable long term Mm -hmm. And then understanding that, okay, this is what works for me. And if I read something that doesn't make sense, not to get thrown off by that or to start start changing what I'm doing just because I read something, but to say, okay, let me maybe test it or try it in myself, see if it works or not, and then Right, exactly. I mean, especially because it can create so much stress when you're like, oh, I don't feel well, and I want to, like, really be in control of my health, and right. I want to, like – be so conscious about the foods that I'm putting in my body and make sure they're the best. And I'm reading this saying that I shouldn't have this. And then I'm reading this that says that I should, it can be so stressful for people. And I always say that if we're not addressing the stress component, then the nutrition is not going to really take you very far. So we have to take the look at you as as like all of these, Mm -hmm. um, other components that are feeding into, um, your, your gut health and to try to take it from there. That's a great point because even even if you're stressed about food and you're stressed about what you're eating, then right. that's a great point. I right. didn't even think about that. Sometimes people will come in and they'll be like, I did everything that you told me to do and I'm not feeling any better. Mm-hmm. And it's like they become so obsessive over it that it's like, okay, let's talk about some other aspects of your life because maybe nutrition isn't um, the key solution right. for you because food helps the majority of people, but um, – there's definitely other factors at play that mm-hmm. it's not going to cure you. Right. Sometimes it can. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure. I actually, I always tell this to patients. Um, I don't know if I'm going to pull something, but I always show this functional medicine tree. Oh, I love that. To one. patients. Mm-hmm. And then like looking specifically down here at the root system mm-hmm. with like all these factors that contribute to your overall mm-hmm. health and well-being, And then looking at how you can focus on creating health with these components instead of treating disease that ends up manifesting up here in the branches so that we're really getting down to the root of the problem instead of treating the branches. Right. I recently heard it described like you have to create healthy soil. If you don't have that in place, it doesn't matter, you know, what you're doing up in the branches. You're never going to be able to have as big of an impact. If you don't it's so true. Soil. I love that picture. It's so true. Well, and even when you look at like how depleted a lot of our soil is now with all of the things oh, that yeah. have 
manifested over the last few decades it's like the nutrient quality of the food isn't as high so how can we like support you to improve the overall quality of your food right maybe you can talk next a little bit about how a functional medicine appointment works here or how what your relationship is like with the patients that come through um, the Center for Functional Medicine. Okay, yeah, sure. So every patient comes in and sees the doctor first for 75 minutes, and then they see, um, usually one of the medical assistants reviews their kits with them. Mm-hmm. Um, like their, um, We run a few different tests that are like blood and urine tests that look at their um, their nutrient composition and their in their body nutrient composition I'm thinking food um, <laughs> <laughs> their nutritional status <laughs> um, and then we do like stool tests and things like that so the medical assistants will review those mm-hmm. and then they come in to see the dietitians mm-hmm. for 60 minutes and all of our new patients um, are required to see the dietitians because we are a food first approach mm-hmm. and then um, they see the health coaches for usually 10 to 15 minutes and then they go to the lab to get all of their lab tests. Um, So it's nice that they then are able to follow up with our health coaches who Mm -hmm. play like a hugely um, important role in checking in to see if they're like ordering all of their supplements Mm -hmm. and if they've um, started their nutrition plan and if they've like established goals for themselves and things like that to kind of like coach them through the process. And then they come back about um, six weeks later and usually I'll start them on a nutrition plan in their initial visit Mm -hmm. and then um, during their follow-up appointment we tailor it more towards their their specific lab values and um, how we can make it more individualized okay so they'll see the doctor for 45 minutes and then they see to review their labs Mm -hmm. then they see the dietitian for 30 minutes okay and make some of those more personalized tweaks yeah exactly um and so What would you say, I know we said it's all individualized, but what would you, if you could give one piece of advice that anyone could benefit from as far as nutrition or a baseline of where people should start from, Mm -hmm. what do you think is most important? Um, that's a really good question. (laughs) (laughs) Or like something you feel like you're telling every single person that comes in here that maybe, um, isn't something that they would do otherwise right so um the the first thing i would say is to to eat um more whole foods Mm -hmm. and uh, to focus more on cooking at home because we know that when you are eating out it's Mm -hmm. it significantly increases people's intake of added sugars sodium saturated fat a lot of harmful um, nutrients and then it decreases people's intake of fruits and vegetables Mm -hmm. and things like that so um, definitely cooking more at home eating more whole foods and um then, I mean, along the same lines, I think that one thing that I see people do a lot is that they start buying more foods from the grocery store and they're trying to look for like organic labels and things like that. And I always caution people to not um, jump to those as uh, being a definitely healthy if they're gluten-free or organic because um, eating a gluten-free organic cookie is going to have the same effect as like a plain Oreo or something like that, um, essentially, unless you have like gluten issues. (laughs) (laughs) But it's like you definitely want to caution people to not jump to that as like, okay, well, this is just healthy and I'm going to include it because a lot of times when people go gluten-free or even when people go vegetarian um, and I'm looking at their food diaries, they're eating a lot more sugar and things like Mm-hmm. that that are um like healthy sugars right. but um then they put this health halo around those foods and actually research um they just came out brian wansink just came out with um this new uh, journal and in the journal they have this paper that they published on the fact that people that have um organic labeled cookies end mm-hmm. up eating more of them than people that are eating just the standard cookies mm-hmm. because you feel less guilty about right. doing so so more whole foods and then um phytonutrients so getting a variety of different colors in um, I think would be a hugely something that I'm telling people all the time because mm-hmm. the, each of the different colors is going to indicate the or the different pigments is going to indicate the different nutrients that right. the fruit or vegetable contains. And so often people will stick with green fruits and vegetables and it's like if you want to benefit from all of the nutrients that are available in plant sources, then you need to be trying to eat every single color at least one time 
per day. Mm -hmm. Um, and then pairing proteins, fats, and carbohydrates at every meal. So whole foods, phytonutrients, and then pairing proteins, fats, and carbs to, um, ensure that you're stabilizing your blood sugar throughout the day and decreasing your insulin secretion Mm -hmm. and to decrease any kind of inflammation as a result. I think that's great advice. And coming from probably a lot of people listening to this who are in the CrossFit community, um, I think they hear that advice or they hear whole foods. They hear our sort of our nutrition in a hundred words from the founder of CrossFit is eat meat and vegetables, nuts and seeds, some fruit, little starch, no sugar, and then eat in quantities that support exercise and not body fat. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people do try to approach it with whole foods first, but they just out of convenience get in the habit of eating the same thing over and over again. Or yes. they cook one oh, thing. Rotation and is next so thing, important. Yeah, next thing you know, you're eating, all you're eating is like chicken, broccoli, <laughs> and like almonds or something for every meal, which is probably better than maybe what you were eating before. But I think that variety component is really important too. It's so important. Wait, will you repeat that again? What the, <laughs> <laughs> it's eat meat and vegetables, uh-huh. nuts and or, seeds. I would add organic and grass fed meat because yes. the quality of yeah, your meat, yeah. what your animal's eating is going to have a significant impact on the nutrient value, the omega-3 content, beta carotene, all of those things and decreasing the, um, inflammatory pieces. But sorry, Absolutely. keep going. Yep. <laughs> um, nuts and seeds, um, some fruit, little starch, and no sugar. Okay. So the little starch is probably like beans and... Yeah, or like potatoes or things like that. Okay. Um, or, I mean, even breads, depending, you know, if you can tolerate that. Okay. Yeah, um, I would add beans to that because I think that in general, I mean, some... Yeah. I'll, I'll take people off of beans mm-hmm. um, sometimes initially for if they're having issues with lectins mm-hmm. or things like that. And then also from like the higher starch content um, because they have about 15 grams of carbs mm-hmm. for about like half of a cup. So... But I think that when you look at populations long term who right. um, have the the best health, uh, like in the blue beans. zones, yeah, yeah it's I like a common denominator. <laughs> <laughs> I was just telling someone about the blue zones last night. I have the DVDs. <laughs> oh, that's of, can I borrow yeah, them? Sure. I only have the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're talking about. Uh, I think it was originally on National Geographic, but this guy named Dan Buettner who goes around, he travels around the world and looks at the communities of people that live the longest and tries to find out what their secrets are. Yeah. It's all sanitarians, people that are living over the age of 100. And he's like, what are these common denominators? Mm -hmm. And it comes down to beans and a lot of plants and relationships he Mm -hmm. finds are a huge thing too. So that goes into, I mean, relationships is on the bottom of that tree looking at like how we can decrease stress and increase happiness and well being because that's going to have an impact on your health too. Absolutely. And we saw like this weekend I was telling someone about it because we were at a wine tasting. And of course, what oh. like re- red wine is one of those things that is common among those communities, but they drink maybe a glass or two at night with their family or with their community. Right. So just that it's probably more that social interaction that's even more important. I don't know if it would be the same if you were just drinking wine by yourself while you're watching TV. You no, know? I agree with that. Well, and I think, too, that that's the nice thing about the CrossFit community is that it's such a community approach so that even if you're eating, like, a different way than what's normal, mm-hmm. it's like you can probably find your your CrossFit friends or your family members who are eating the same way as you mm-hmm. so that you can share in, like, making meals and looking for recipes together and things like that, Very even true. though you have specialized dietary um habits things right. like that because like honestly it can be socially isolating to eat um very restrictive and sure. so i think that to have that support mm-hmm. is so huge that's a perfect segue into my next question i was perfect. gonna ask you that. Well, <laughs> we so, didn't plan yeah. this <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people probably know what they should be eating but the problem comes in the implementation or being in a social environment that maybe isn't conducive to eating that way or maybe they're stressed and so they fall back on bad habits Do you have any tools that you give people to help implement some of these things in their lives? Yeah, so we're actually, I was just talking about that um, this morning. I met with the, someone from Vitamix, and we were oh, talking okay. about how, like, helpful Vitamix can be yes. as a, an actual tool for implementing these changes because it's, like, you can throw in vegetables, you can throw in whatever and make a smoothie, or you mm-hmm. can make soups, like, so many easy things um, to kind of, like, push you out of the way that you were eating and filling your body with a lot of nutrient-dense foods in a, like, fast and convenient way. Mm-hmm. So Vitamix would be one. <laughs> <laughs> I do use mine to make my smoothie in the morning. <laughs> oh, perfect. 
You said uh, blender in general. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. Or a blender in general. I'm sorry. <laughs> but if you're making a lot of the, like the other day I was making this cauliflower sauce mm-hmm. that was made from cauliflowers, nutritional yeast, um, lemon and broth and vegetable broth mm-hmm. and it was like so easy to throw in the bl- in the Vitamix. It's yeah. like so high powered that it just chops through the right. cauliflower and makes it like <laughs> sauce that's out of your vegetables. So you don't even need to have the vegetables on the side. Right. <laughs> so much easier to eat that way. Yeah, Very exactly. Uh, and over bean pasta, it's like you're Ooh, getting yeah. your protein <laughs> and your vegetables with some olive oil and your fat. It's perfect. Um, okay, so yeah, a blender I think would be uh, huge. Mm-hmm. Um we're creating the these like shared medical appointments because okay. i think that having people to go through the process with is so huge mm-hmm. um so like i said like having the support and finding like new recipe blogs and things like that like i'm always throwing out recipe blogs mm-hmm. that i like to follow like um deliciously ella is one of my favorites mm-hmm. she's gluten free and dairy free she just came out with a new book and um then Elena's Pantry is one that's been around. She was, like, eating paleo in 2007 before wow. anyone, like, even knew what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and so she has, like, awesome recipes. Mm. And um, there's another one that's uh, – she's vegetarian, so it probably won't fit with CrossFit very well. That's but okay. She has some so really like good – Yeah, <laughs> a lot of good vegetable <laughs> recipes. Um, Whole Living Lauren is really good. Um, and then the um, – the – something – the spunky coconut is oh. paleo as well. Wow. And heard of that. Um, so just trying to think about, you know, other avenues because if you can get recipes, that's huge for people. Mm-hmm. It like gets you thinking out of the box where it's like, wow, I guess food didn't have to be that way. Right. You know, like I didn't have to be eating refined pasta for dinner every night because there are alternatives that I can teach myself to like and they take no additional time. Mm-hmm. So I think that a lot of it is like guiding people through changing their norms. You know, it's like um norms create so much of the they drive our behavior Mm -hmm. so if you can create these like new normalized patterns then Mm -hmm. it makes it so much easier so recipes vitamix uh, food processors i think you're really great totally (laughs) i love it all right i want to close with three questions i ask everyone who comes on the podcast so first one is if you can tell us three things you do on a regular basis that you really do in real life that you think have the overall biggest positive impact on your health okay (laughs) (laughs) but I actually do no (laughs) um so I cook all of my meals Mm -hmm. and um I probably go out um once a week okay that depends on if I'm hanging out with my boyfriend or not because he's usually the driver of that (laughs) (laughs) um so cooking at home so that I'm in control and like planning my meals on Sundays is huge for me. If I don't okay. do that, then I'm like lost for the week. Right. Um, so planning, packing lunches and eating from my own kitchen mm-hmm. um, would be number one. And then this is such a good question. <laughs> and then number two would be. um. So I've actually been trying to increase the number of steps that I take a day. Oh, nice. But it's not going as well as I would <laughs> like, so I can't really use that one. I have to. I just started wearing my Fitbit because I started the Cleveland Clinic insurance plan here. Yes. And you have to get a certain – you have to meet certain requirements to get the discount. Yeah. I, I forgot mine, but yeah. I've been doing the and same thing. And I keep thing. forgetting to wear it, and it's very disappointing. <laughs> when but I, it helps so much oh, to have does. that, like – understanding of how sedentary you are it's Mm -hmm. like such a good motive too if I don't walk a lot throughout the day it's like I am definitely gonna like incorporate some kind of cardio into Mm -hmm. what I'm doing if I'm going to yoga Mm -hmm. so yoga I guess would be another one Mm -hmm. um I try to go to yoga at least three times a week Mm -hmm. and I think that that helps so much with like not only staying in shape but um with my like mental sanity um it's a good like two for one (laughs) absolutely I've been doing a lot more yoga this year too probably I try to go once at least once a week but sometimes I can make it twice a week but I notice a big difference the weeks that I go versus well and don't you think that it helps just like from a stretching component probably with the balance of CrossFit absolutely I think my body just feels better overall like I can recover better from the other workouts that I'm doing yeah 
That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, so yoga, I'm eating from my own kitchen, and then trying to get a lot of non-starchy vegetables into my diet is something that I do every single day. So um, I try to get at least six to seven servings with six – or with one serving being about a cup raw or half a cup cooked Okay. um, so that I can just incorporate that as the base of most of my meals because I think that regardless, like um, when – when I planned that food day event that you came to mm-hmm. um, in October of 2014, food day I like absolutely love. It's a nonprofit <laughs> that celebrates real food on October 24th every year. Mm-hmm. And then they have all of these like local people in the community that you're able to like plan your own events. So you should look into that if you're interested. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had Dr. Hyman and Jane Esselstyn speak. And Dr. Hyman's obviously like very – geared towards a paleo way of eating. And then Jane Esselstyn is the daughter of um, Dr. Esselstyn who wrote the Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease Mm -hmm. book. And then Jane and her mom wrote the Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease cookbook. And so she was talking about like eating vegan. And the reason that I wanted both of them to be there was because it was like, I want you to emphasize the importance of just like eating a lot of vegetables and plant-based foods and then including these other components in Mm -hmm. so if you're going to eat meat I think that that's fine if it's organic and it's high quality Mm -hmm. but you have to have the vegetables in your diet right and I think that that's really like the key message where it doesn't really matter what you're doing but having the plant-based foods helps so much absolutely absolutely I liked that comparison too that was a really I had a great time at that event and it was cool because I've even had comments of people on the podcast saying, oh, are you at the Cleveland Clinic where they have the Esselstyn diet? What do you think of it compared to paleo? And there's, it's again, it's that people tr- always trying to make an argument about food. But like you said, there's right. these common denominators that just no matter what diet you're talking about, don't go away. And the vegetables, I think, are that. Right. Well, and the other thing is, is that it depends on the individual. Mm-hmm. So people that like they've been able to identify in research that like Dean Ornish's plant-based diet, that Dr. Esselstyn's plant-based diet, they've done some other studies at the Cleveland Clinic Wellness Institute where like mm-hmm. plant-based diets are so beneficial for reversing heart disease. Mm-hmm. They've not been able to show that for a paleo diet. So, but there are benefits to a paleo diet for right. other types of people. And so I think that finding that Dr. Hyman would probably argue for every person, but <laughs> <laughs> I think that finding that, that middle ground and customizing it to what you're actually right. dealing with. And if it's more of like an IBS thing, then paleo would probably work better because it's going to eliminate some of the foods that can cause a lot of bloating and things like that, like mm-hmm. the beans and the more starchy foods that are typically in a vegetarian diet. Mm-hmm. So I struggled with that for a really long time because I came from the Wellness Institute where they really advocate for vegetarian and plant-based diets. And then I came here and I had to like – develop that understanding on my own where it's like there's a different different people need different things right it's just nutrition isn't one size fits all I love it (laughs) (laughs) I know the CrossFit community probably thinks paleo for everyone but (laughs) no I think that that's I think that that's something that we even advocate not even just for nutrition but for everything in CrossFit is almost like a self-experimentation like do it if it works for you, if your performance is getting better, like use that as your metric. If your performance is getting better, then that's something you should continue. Right. If you try, you know, maybe changing your diet or you're not getting enough sleep or you're spreading yourself too thin and your performance starts to decrease, you know, okay, I need to change something because something isn't working here. Right. Exactly. So I think that that concept is something we're all really familiar with. Good. I'm glad. (laughs) Um, How about one thing that you think would have a big impact on your health, but you just struggle to implement it or you haven't been consistent with it? Walking 10,000 steps a day. (laughs) Remembering to wear your Fitbit. And remembering to wear my Fitbit. I actually lost my charger. That was my problem. I was wearing it every day and then I lost my charger. And so now I found my charger. Thank God. And, um, I just need to remember now that I've gotten out of the habit. But walking throughout the day is so huge. I mean, walking is like – or sitting is like the new smoking. So they – I was just at a lecture a few weeks ago, and she was talking about how even just sitting – They it it was an animal study, but they found that it decreased your metabolism by 90% to be sitting all day. And it's like, wow, that is astonishing. It's crazy. crazy. And when you think about whatever you do for your job, but if you're sitting – if your job requires you to sit a lot – 
Right, Next like I'm know, sitting in with yeah. patients all day. Luckily in our new space, I think that we're getting standing desks, which oh, will help perfect. a lot. But um, I try to take walking breaks mm-hmm. as much as possible. Um, it just doesn't always happen. Right. So it's one area that I'm trying to figure okay. out. <laughs> <laughs> Last question is, what does a healthy life look like to you? A healthy life looks like... Um, I think the balance is really important. Um, So a healthy life would be finding what fulfills you Mm -hmm. and taking like a really authentic approach to your life instead of trying to fit into like what you think that you have to do. Um, I think that's huge from like a stress perspective. And uh, um, then doing things because you enjoy them that happen to be healthy. So like the same kind of exercise isn't going to isn't going to work for everyone. Like not everyone loves CrossFit. I'm personally kind of intimidated by it. <laughs> <laughs> As most people are before they start, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. But um I think the finding what works best for yeah. you whether it's like dance or um kayaking or paddleboarding or whatever depending on where you live um and things that you can do consistently um eating well obviously eating a balanced diet cooking most of your food and including that in your lifestyle Mm -hmm. um and then relationships I think are a huge one so having like really supportive relationships that are going to uh, um, be in favor of what you uh, are trying to pursue in your own life and incorporating the healthy lifestyle so that you're like working out together or eating well together or going to church together or all these things that you know that social impact is huge Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better <laughs> myself. <laughs> I love it. So, well, well, thank you so much for sitting down with me yeah, today. Yeah, of course. Thank you um, for coming. It's so and fun. Yeah, we'll have to sit and chat a little bit more next time. Definitely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all so much for tuning into this episode. I hope you learned something from Bridget just like I did. To make sure you never miss an episode in the future and to receive exclusive content from me, head over to my website, juliefouché.com, and subscribe to my email list. Also, don't forget to share your stories. If you or someone you know has used lifestyle to overcome a serious health challenge, please email me at info at juliefouché.com. I'll choose some of these stories to share here on the podcast in future episodes. Also, if you like what you hear, don't forget to subscribe and give us a rating on iTunes and continue to share your feedback on social media with hashtag JFHealth. Thank you again so much for listening, and I'll catch you next time on Pursuing Health.